from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by West Virginia University, a land-grant, space-grant, R1 research institution. Learn more at wvu.edu. Good evening from the Capitol Building in Charleston, I'm Dave Mistich. A two-pronged tax overhaul proposal in the Senate is now halfway complete. The sweeping proposal calls for the elimination of manufacturing machinery, equipment, and inventory taxes, on, as well as those on motor vehicles and other personal property. It also calls for hikes to tobacco and consumer sales taxes. The legislation has passed, but a joint resolution that would make the bill constitutional was held over until tomorrow. Joining me now to talk about the tax overhaul is Senate President Mitch Carmichael and Senator Mike Romano. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Great to be Senator, here. Thank you. Great. So the Senate essentially just left, let out and Senate Bill 837 passed by a single vote. Uh, I want to start with you, uh, Senate President Mitch Carmichael. Tell me a little bit about this proposal and why it's been structured the way it has. Well, it's been something that we've talked about around this body for years and years, and I want to commend my uh, good friend Mike Romano for helping uh, on many of the aspects of it with the elimination of the property tax on motor vehicles. And he's also shared, uh, many in the Democrat aisle, share the vision of getting rid of the inventory and manufacturing equipment tax because we're way out of step with our surrounding uh, states and with many of the states throughout America. Now, uh, we believe that we should do something about that, and we've waited for too long to get to a point where we can eliminate that tax so that we can provide jobs and our citizens can get, have an opportunity to compete for those jobs. And then likewise, this is also a Taxpayer Forgiveness Act in the sense that uh, for too long, we have forced citizens of West Virginia to not only buy their car and pay a sales tax, but then pay a tax on it every year thereafter. And we just think that's the wrong way to uh, tax our citizens. And so we put forth an, uh, a proposal that would slightly raise the uh, consumer sales tax, half a percent, and then raise the uh, tobacco tax fairly significantly. So we believe it's a good package and, uh, you know, there are obviously issues with it. Uh, there always will be on any major overhaul, but we think this is a great first step and uh, look forward to working with our colleagues to uh, implement the passage. Right, and, th and this phase out would be over the course of six years. Um, there would be a special revenue fund created uh, that would take this revenue from the tobacco tax increase, the consumer sales tax increase, <clears throat> to try to backfill or replace the revenue that would be lost. Uh, yeah. Senator Romano, it's my understanding that there's about a $300 million uh, loss of revenue uh, with the repeal of these manufacturing uh, taxes, the personal property tax on vehicle. Um, but there is this replacement revenue. In your mind, is this the most um, well thought out plan to backfill that money? Well, absolutely not. And you know, with all due respect to my friend, we're really playing magicians here. The, the proposal that just got passed by one vote is almost like a magic trick. Over here they're saying we're going to lower motor vehicle tax for our individual citizens in West Virginia to the tune of about $100 million. But on this hand, they're going to increase taxes in the form of sales taxes and tobacco taxes on those same individuals by $200 million. You do the math any way you want. That's a tax increase on the individuals in the state of West Virginia. Now, we want to get rid of the motor vehicle tax. The fact that, you know, with my, the president just mentioned, you know, we tried to uh, pass an amendment that would have focused it just on motor vehicle tax because a tax cut for West Virginians is always good. Puts money back in the economy and creates economic activity, and that's what creates jobs, not giving money back to the rich. And what we're really doing here is we are funding a tax break that 70% of it is going to go to out-of-state companies in the form of reduced taxes on uh, uh, personal property tax for equipment and inventory, and that's going to be taken out of the state and not benefit the state at all. Small businesses are the most important thing we have in West Virginia, and while this is going to benefit them a little bit, it's going to benefit the much larger out-of-state companies much, much more. The, the, the issue really is, had, had we been able to work together with our Republican colleagues, I think we could have come up with a better way to get rid of the inventory tax and the, uh, the manufacturing equipment tax that wouldn't have burdened the individuals in our state. Our individual taxpayers are already burdened too much. 
part of the problem in our state is we never do anything to benefit them. And so they never have money in their pockets to go out and spend at restaurants or buy new cars or, or buy air conditioners or do any of the things that they need to do for their families because we're constantly taking away money and giving it to big out-of-state corporations. And we've done this. You know, there's an old saying, those who fail to know history are doomed to repeat it. We've gotten rid of the franchise tax. We've lowered the corporate net tax, each with promises that they were going to come running over the hills and start establishing businesses here. It hasn't happened. The, the, we got a uh, right to work and at the end ended prevailing wage with the promise of $300 million in savings. We haven't seen that. The, the bottom line here is we need a well-trained workforce, educated people, we need a healthy population, and we need flat land to really start attracting businesses the way that everybody keeps promising uh, in, in face of these tax cuts that don't benefit anybody in the state. Right, and, and I do want to take a break here for just a moment. There's been a lot of different kinds of groups weigh in on this. A lot of people uh, invested very deeply in this particular proposal. And right now I want to throw to a clip from uh, Sean O'Leary from the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy, and we'll come back and have you two react to that statement. If we get rid of the personal property tax, what you see with most other states that, you know, the ones that don't have this tax have much, much higher real estate taxes. I don't think there's going to be any appetite for anything like that. Um, the proposal right now to raise the sales tax is, is, is one that asks basically low and middle income West Virginians, will you pay for this tax cut? Um, and, and just the idea that, again, we're, you know, next year we're facing a $100 million budget gap. And the year after that, 170. The year after that, 200. We don't have the money for this. If that's him, it's a, that, it's a math question that there's been no answer to. And uh, President Carmichael, he mentioned, you know, the, the math involved with all this. Um, I think there's been concerns. Uh, it, it was mentioned in the Senate Finance Committee that the fund that would be created uh, may become insolvent in 12 years. Uh, given what Mr. O'Leary said there in those comments and what we know about where the, the status of all this is right now, what do you have to say? Well, as Ronald Reagan once said, there they go again. And it's always about trying to grab more of the people's money and not give a tax cut to working West Virginians in the form of the elimination of their personal property tax on their automobile. Who wants to continue to pay for a product and be taxed for it that you already purchased? That's what we're talking about. It's $150 million. Furthermore, uh, those who want to characterize this as a tax cut for business should be thankful in the sense that our citizens, the only way you get this tax cut if you're a business is to employ a West Virginian, have manufacturing uh, equipment and inventory in our state. So we want those jobs. And I uh, reject the argument that uh, we don't want those jobs and that we should be out of step with the rest of America. I think we need to be in line and compete for those jobs. And people like Sean O'Leary, who I'm sure he's a you know, good guy, but he represents big government. Continue to hold on to all the revenue you can get we represent, as I think President Trump represents, the fact that we want to cut taxes and generate growth. And that's what we've seen throughout America, and that's what we want to do in West Virginia. Senator Romano. With all due respect to my good friend here, and, I, and Mitch and I do get along well, we're, we're friends, but you know, we've created the Intermediate Court of Appeals. $10 million minimum coming out of our state taxes to create a new layer of government, new regulation. That's not smaller government, that's bigger government. This is simply a tax cut for the big manufacturing companies who, you know, support the other side of the aisle as opposed to my aisle, side of the aisle. And, and it's simply going to benefit them the most. What we're going to do is we're going to make individuals in this state, the regular citizens, pay for this tax cut in the form of more sales taxes and more tobacco taxes. They're going to get $100 million, but they're going to pay $200 million. That's, that's just not a good deal. And the reality of it is that, you know, we, we talk about big business, local control. We're taking over the counties in this state because the legislature, who's ever in charge of this legislature, is going to control the budgets of every county in this state. And that just means we're an extension of state government that the counties are no longer going to have no longer going to have local control. People aren't going to be able to vote for their, their county commissioners who are going to set the tax rates because, you know what, it's going to be in the hands of the legislature. That's a complete takeover of county government and local control in this state, something I've always heard my friends on the other side of the aisle say they're not for, but they always seem to get there and be able to do that, and that's what this is. This is a massive takeover of county government. Right, and, and one of the arguments in support of all of this uh, has been that this would, and you know, you've said it already, is that this would bring in new jobs, sure. new manufacturing jobs. I should mention that we spoke to Rebecca McPhail of the West Virginia Manufacturers Association. That was so late, uh, given our deadline tonight, mm -hmm. that we're not able to get it into the show. But I guess if, and I know that you're on that side of the argument, so if you would articulate, um, a lot of these counties, 
uh, already have this manufacturing, um, would, would the manufacturing be driven to those counties where that where this manufacturing is already being taken place, or or is this going to go to like smaller, um, less manufacturing heavy counties like Calhoun and other places in the state? Well, we don't want to specify exactly where the manufacturing entities will locate, but what we want to do is to incentivize manufacturing to come to West Virginia. And we don't have, you don't have to take my word for this. This has been studied for 30 years around this capital by governors from both parties and renowned economists that said this is the number one job killing tax in our state. And I know, uh, you know, Mike and those on the other side of the air will share my view that when we find a problem, when we identify a problem that's costing working West Virginians jobs, then we want to address it. Now, somebody can always say, like, you know, the three bears or whatever, this isn't the perfect plan. You know, you have to have the perfect plan. I want to take a, this step. Uh, and, you know, so for those who want to criticize and say, well, you could have had a different priority and all this kind of thing, it's nothing's perfect, but this is a step in the right direction. And I, I think it's a much better use of funds than, uh, you know, paying for greyhound breeders. Uh, so this is, uh, I want to eliminate the tax on property tax on a person's automobile and give working West Virginians an opportunity to have that money in their pocket. I, I want to uh, talk for a moment about the vote itself. Mm -hmm. um, 17 to 16, Senator Randy Smith was in the back of the chamber. It was 16 to 16, he walked up, hit the green button, made it 17 to 16. But that being said, you've still got Senate Joint Resolution 9, and the way I understand it, Senate Bill 837 is contingent upon the passage, the adoption, the ratification of the yeah. amendment. So, well, that's a great point, Dave, and I know Mike shares this point, is this Senate Joint Resolution 9 enables the people of West Virginia to vote on this. That's all we're doing with Senate Resolution 9. It puts it before the voters, and I think, as uh, Senator Trump said today, it's arrogance beyond belief to say that we shouldn't give the voters of West Virginia an opportunity to determine their tax structure. And for us to just simply withhold from them the opportunity to, to weigh in on this is totally wrong in a democracy. Senator Romano. Yeah, you know, I, and, and quite frankly, I have no problem with the, the, the voters being able to vote on taking the, the property taxes out of the Constitution. I think it'd be a bad idea. There's a reason that it's in there. It's because the people who live in these counties didn't want the state legislature to control their county government. Now the problem is, the, you know, our friends are going to dangle this motor vehicle tax decrease without fully explaining that there's really an, an overall net increase in, in taxes on individuals because of the sales tax and tobacco tax. So there's going to be a desire to pass it. But the reality is that not only are we going to destroy their county governments, but with this tax structure that we now know the plan is clear. The plan's clear to lower motor vehicle taxes 100 million, but put 200 million dollars in tax increases on those same individuals. It, it's a bad deal. We talk about a perfect deal. The perfect deal is that if you're going to get rid of a gross income tax, which is what the machinery and, and inventory tax is, right. then you should have replaced it with other business taxes that are based on net income. That way you get rid of the burden on businesses, but you still let businesses pay their fair share of tax. We're already the 19th lowest uh, business tax state climate in the country based on a study by the National Tax Foundation. So I don't know what lowering our taxes is going to bring in any new businesses. And let me also say that there's 30 some states that have some form of uh, uh, manufacturing equipment or business inventory tax, including Texas that we hold out all the time as our uh, grand example we want to be like. They have this tax that we're trying to get rid of. The goal is not just to get rid of the tax for these businesses because it's not going to bring them in. The goal is simply to move the tax from a gross income tax, which means you pay the tax where you're making a profit or not, and then basing it on your net income, which means if you make a profit, you pay the tax. If you don't make a profit, you don't pay the tax. Taking that tax and eliminating it and putting it on the backs of our individual citizens in this state is the wrong idea. It'll drive more people out of this state. It'll put a further retard uh, business activity in this state and will continue down the path that we have. We've lost 57,000 people since 2015 when my friends took over the majority. That's the most we've lost in any stretch in a state that's lost citizens for the last 100 years. Things are not going right. The budget is not in good shape. We have holes in the budget coming up over the next few years that we're not going to be able to plug. And if you think we're going to use that money that we're saving uh, to, to backfill the counties when we have holes in our own state budget, well, we're kidding ourselves. That money will disappear quickly. Uh, it sounds like you wanted to uh, step well, in just there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, a few years ago when we came into the majority, we had a $400 million deficit. 
Last year, we provided the largest pay raises in state history for our public employees and our teachers and ran a $500 million surplus. We have turned the corner. And for us, uh, I think you'll see a clear distinction here between the two philosophies. One is to hang on to big government and to continue to take from the people and from businesses who aren't our enemies. Businesses are not our enemies. They employ our citizens and pay taxes, and we want to help them be successful in West Virginia. So uh, I'm willing to make some changes here to move West Virginia forward, and I just uh, ask people all throughout the state of West Virginia, my friends on the other side of the aisle, to join us in moving West Virginia forward. Right. Uh, we've got just a few moments left here, but 20 seconds left here for each of you. Senate Joint Resolution 9 is laid over. What's the plan really quickly? To vote on it tomorrow or Wednesday at the very latest, and uh, hopefully to get 23 votes at least. Right. And the Democrats, I take it that, uh, you know, the, the vote today may reflect somewhat, maybe maybe slightly different than yeah, coming I, up I think in we 20 need to go, seconds. I think we need to go back and revisit now that we've seen that 837, which nobody liked, has now passed. But let me also say that 80% of our employment in this state is small business. They're going to only benefit by about 30% of this tax cut. 70% of this tax cut goes to out-of-state businesses. That money will not be invested here to create new jobs or new employment. It's simply going to go out-of-state to help that corporation wherever it, it feels like the best place to invest its money. We need investment in this state. We need to help small business in the state, not big out-of-state manufacturing. Right. Senator President Mitch Carmichael, Senator Mike Romano, a Democrat from Harrison County, of course, a Republican from Jackson County. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank you, my friend. Always right. Thank you. <laughs> Next, House Bill 4780 was the focus of a public hearing this morning. The bill would allow public schools to offer instruction on the Bible as an elective. Here's a series of comments from that public hearing. People like me who cherish holy texts cannot and must not stand by when our sacred texts are used, even with the best of intentions, in a way that would marginalize students of different faiths and say that one text, one sacred text, is more important, more sacred than another. And that's what this bill does. It declares that one sacred text is critical to understanding our country. First of all, the Bible is the first book that was ever printed, and it was printed in 1611. And the Supreme Court ruled in 1963 that it certainly may be said that the Bible is worthy of study for its literary and historic qualities. Nothing we have said here indicates that such study of the Bible uh, or of, the, of religion when presented objectively as part of a secular program of education may not be affected consistently with the First Amendment. So this is not unconstitutional. It is not a required class. No student will be required to take it. No teacher will be, be required to teach it. Both will be voluntary. It is a historical and literary context class, not a religious context. It is an elective. It is not mandated. No specific version is required. This is high school only. Our Muslim children and those other children have already different look and they have already been discriminated against. And those girls who wear the hijab, such as myself, they already feel discrimination, isolation, and demonization from other children and sometimes from some teachers as well. So we don't need to have them pointed at when they choose not to take this class. West Virginia has an opportunity to pass legislation that would allow the Bible to be made available as an elective in high school curriculum. The Bible is still the greatest and most influential book ever written. It's still the world's bestseller. Its benefits are many. In the context of this bill as a social studies class, students could gain and learn about its influence on the foundation of our nation. Many of our founders were themselves fleeing religious persecution and wrote into our Constitution that this new republic would not favor or require one religion over another. Let's keep it that way. 23 people spoke at the public hearing, 12 opposed the bill, 11 were in favor. Good evening, I'm Suzanne Higgins. Joining me now, Emily Allen, to uh, further the, the journey of uh, 4780 today. We had, the public we had the public hearing first thing in the morning, then the House convened at 11 o'clock. It was on what? Second Amendment. It was on Amendment Stage, second reading. What happened? Yeah, so um, there was an amendment introduced. First, let me ask you a little bit more about the bill. Oh. What does the bill allow? Of course, that's a good point. Um, so this bill would allow um, county boards of education to like, let high school students take an elective about the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament, Hebrew scriptures. 
Um, and, and I should mention the Senate is also kind of considering this bill as well, although it's amended, uh, and we'll talk about that. But today, while it was on the amendment stage in the House, uh, Democratic delegates Mike Pushkin from Kanawha County and uh, John Doyle from Jefferson County, the Northeastern Panhandle, I believe, um, they both introduced an amendment that um, addressed the constitutionality of the bill and addressed kind of the, you know, uh, reportedly exclusiveness of the bill toward other religions. So um, I, I think the comments that most resonated with me were from Delegate Mike Pushkin, uh, the Democrat from Kanawha County. He um, said, and you're about to hear it in this next clip, that the bill was exclusive to other religions. Um, he grew up Jewish. So when the bill specifically says something like the Old Testament that kind of contradicts his faith because they don't use that term for the Bible. Um, so here he is talking about that um, kind of conflict. Just by having that, the phrase Old Testament in there, for example, is really discrediting the religion that I grew up in. It's problematic language that you're putting in code to call what I grew up reading and believing of the Old Testament. That's not how we refer to it. Um, simply having that in there is discrediting a religion that not a whole lot of West Virginians practice, but I can assure you a few of us do. Other remarks? Yeah, so uh, Delegate Pushkin and uh, Delegate Doyle as well, another big remark they had was the constitutionality of the bill. Maybe it, uh, it violates this kind of separation between church and state. So Delegate Pushkin read out the state uh, constitution or the state code, the part specifically where it says, you know, the legislature can't um, promote one religion or, or push it onto its constituents. So is this bill kind of like that? Um, obviously, the delegates who are in favor of the bill, and you heard them this morning in the public hearing, um, emphasized that the this bill more so focuses on the literature than the religion aspect of it. So here's Delegate uh, Bartlett, a Republican, and also the lead sponsor of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I certainly urge rejection of this amendment in that it is a complete departure uh, from the intent of the bill. Uh, the, the amendment ignores uh, the basic premise of the bill, which is this, that the Bible is the most influential and significant book of all human history, apart from its religious and theological implications. And that giving school boards the option of offering an elective course to high school students would give the choice to those students to take a one-year course on the historical, literary, and cultural significance of the Bible. And there's a companion bill in the Senate, Senate Bill yes. 38. But that bill, and Delegate Pushkin mentioned it too, they did accept these kind of um, amendments where it would be, um, you know, other religions or they could choose between like sacred texts. Um, so there will likely be a conference committee to resolve that uh, sort of difference. And, and uh, Chair uh, Joe Ellington even said, Said mm -hmm. that there would yeah, no doubt kinda... be some conferees. <laughs> yeah. Another bill up for the up for a vote today in the House was uh, committee substitute for House Bill 4009, and that's relating to in, involuntary hospitalization. There were a lot of remarks and debate on that today. Yeah. So specifically, what the bill does um, is it authorizes you know an eligible physician to if they notice uh, somebody in their care. Um, has kind of an altered mind or state due to substance or, you know, due to mental state that's a, a harm to themselves or others, that physician can make the call whether to um, involuntarily hospitalize them or not. Obviously, uh, you can imagine one of the big complaints, it was, you know, where does due process of law fit into this? But another thing that kind of came into it was um, gun control, like gun rights. Um, you know, if somebody is involuntarily hospitalized, does this automatically put them on some kind of list that, um, you know, revokes their Second Amendment right? And the, you know, people who responded to that um, obviously mentioned that, no, for that, there must be some kind of due process involved. But that was the argument the bill did pass, and it is uh, off to the Senate. Um, there, and and I, I wanted to point out that there were, there were several um, people involved in health care, involved um, in the hospital situation, um, d Delegate Summers, uh, Delegate Staggers, mm -hmm. who um, spoke to just, uh, you know, the responsibility of that health provider knowing that these folks are going to be let go and they can't do anything about it. They were t speaking to the need of um, the involuntary hospitalization, even for just a couple hours. Um, and another thing that happened today, of course, is uh, Katherine Johnson of, yes. of West Virginia, the 100-year-old 
um, renowned NASA mathematician, um, passed away this morning. Uh, as an African American woman, of course, she broke barriers uh, within brain. NASA. The, book, the, movie the was hidden figures. Hidden um, figures. <laughs> hidden figures. Yeah. And um, in the STEM fields in general. And, you know, both chambers, Emily, acknowledged her passing. Mm -hmm. And then there were similar action, there was similar action taken in both. Uh, in both chambers about uh, a legislation that's that's named in her honor. Tell yes. us about it. Um, so they're both Fair Pay Acts, um, which kind of really rela relates to her story. Um, it's the Katherine Johnson and Dorothy Vaughn Fair Pay, the or Fair Pay Act of 2020. And then in the Senate, it was just the, um, the, the Katherine Johnson mm -hmm. Fair Pay Act. So what both bills would have done as companion bills is um, they would have ensured, you know, equal fair pay for women uh, in the workforce. These bills died in committee last week uh, because, you know, crossovers this Wednesday. Both houses, uh, Democratic uh, legislators, you know, requested that those bills come back up for another vote and both failed today. The, so. They were, the, there was so a motion discharge to discharge from the committee, from the committee yeah. and they both failed. All right, we are out of time. Emily Allen, thank you so much for joining me. Tomorrow on the legislature today, a special report on domestic and sexual violence in West Virginia and a follow-up conversation on the status of several bills designed to support victims, plus coverage of additional news and activities here at the Capitol. I'm Suzanne Higgins. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. Hi, I'm Todd Freimeyer, and I am your West Virginia Public Broadcasting Media Sales Associate for Northern West Virginia. If you'd like to know more about how your business or organization can sponsor this programming, please contact me at 304-556-4000.